Akinjus were the most important of the frontier units on the Western Front during the Classical period. Their numbers reached 40,000 during the mid 15th century and passed 50,000 at the beginning of the 16th century. The Akinjus are noted as the direct successors of the Ghazi Marcher Lords, who were the main group of provincial cavalry into the enlargement of the Sipahi. The conquest of Thrace, Morea, Bulgaria, and Serbia became possible only after the continuous and destructive raids of the Akinjus. The government paid special attention to control the activities and the personnel of the Akinjus groups, most of which were organized under the control of hereditary Akinjus families by issuing licenses and keeping strict master lists. Obviously, the government wanted the Akinjus to conduct raids within the parameters of the overall strategy, as well as to tax them effectively. However, it was nearly impossible to control hundreds of small groups operating independently and as often as not in their own interests. The government had to reach a compromise with these small groups by introducing the harami or banded category. This essentially gave a free hand to groups of less than 100 to conduct raids into the enemy territory after coordinating the activity with regional Akinja leaders and paying a tax after the successful end of the raid. This was an uneasy compromise for the government that not surprisingly created an occasional crisis with neighboring countries. From the perspective of the government, however, the Akinja and Harami activities were useful for wearing down the enemy and were very profitable and more importantly acted as a safety valve in releasing the dangerous pressure of unemployed and volatile youth. Nearly every spring large and small parties poured into the enemy territory in every way possible by using methods of disguise and rapid movement these groups penetrated deep into target regions in small parties, gathering together to launch attacks and then withdrew with booty and slaves. The Akinja always enlisted martyr losses, these local Greek collaborators, in order to acquire accurate intelligence about the enemy and terrain. The government often tasked Akinjas to conduct vicious raids into the enemy regions, either before the start of a campaign in order to weaken the enemy and terrify the population or as a means of punishment for misdeeds. The Akinjus managed to launch raids deep into Habsburg, Venetian and Polish domains as early as 1480. In addition to the main activities of raiding, the Akinjus provided valuable services during the campaigns. With their intimate knowledge of terrain and local connections, they were price the scouts and vanguard units that always operate three to five days in front of the main body securing critical points and capturing prisoners for interrogation. The Akinjas were also well known for their daring, spoiling attacks on enemy units trying to reach the battlefield in proper formation. Sometimes they were tasked to provide provisions for the army by looting the enemy territory, but it was always difficult to control and command the Akinjas during campaigns. And of course, they had several inherent combat vulnerabilities and problems First, they were almost useless during conventional combat, if employed as conventional light cavalry, because they were not light cavalry at all. In most cases, they preferred to flee rather than stand and face the enemy directly, unlike the Sipahi, who were, in all sense of the word, a cavalry force. So, if the chances of looting were slim and the conditions of campaign were harsh, then it was difficult to keep them obedient. Lastly, they had a contentious relationship with a standing army. Because the presence of the unruly and troublesome Akinjas was potentially harmful to discipline and order of the regular units. Often commanders tried to keep them apart from the conventional army, but they were not always successful in their efforts. Although these institutional shortcomings created problems, they were not too large or difficult to manage. Their loyalty to the Sultan and the state as a whole was the biggest problem because they remain troublesome and try to protect their independence at all costs. The Akinjas actively took part in every Ottoman succession crisis and often provide a sanctuary for pretenders of the throne. So it's not surprisingly Ottoman sultans, starting with Bayezid I, tried to curb the power bases of hereditary Akinja leaders and introduce more controls. These policies were carried out, but the Akinjas continued to produce. These policies were carried out, but the Akinjas produced. These policies were carried out, but the Akinjas continued to produce political problems on a lesser scale. 
In addition to the deliberate policies of the government, several other factors weakened the Akhenjis. The first factor was the increasing participation of the Crimean Tatar units in the army, which performed the same tasks that the Akhenjis had provided. In numerical terms, the arrival of 50,000 Tatars was enough to ensure the chance of success in any campaign. Beginning with the Moldavia campaign in 1484, the Crimean Khans began to send light cavalry units to support the Ottoman expeditionary armies. Initially, their contribution was limited and unpredictably haphazard, but later on the contributions became an important characteristic of Ottoman effectiveness. In fact, the presence of Crimean units became so essential to the army that during the Long War, 1593 to 1606, their late arrival postponed major operations. The Khans tried to preserve their semi-independent status even during the conduct of military operations. Due to their increased political dependence on the Ottoman Empire, however, their militaries became increasingly an integral part of Ottoman military. So entwined were the two armies that the Ottomans assisted the burning of Moscow in 1571, causing then Tsar Ivan the Terrible to avoid the city for many years. A second factor was the increased awareness and capacity of neighbouring states to counter Akhenjur raids. Especially after the beginning of the 16th century, Hungary launched a massive construction campaign of building fortresses, which the Habsburg Empire continued on more successfully. They built not only large fortresses, but also various types of small fortifications, specifically designed against the Akhenjur. Additionally, they raised village defence units and created regional mobile troops to support them. Most often, these territorial defense units preferred to attack Akhenjur units returning on the, to their home bases. This tactic was a logical choice, because it was very difficult to prevent the unpredictable and irregular Akhenjur attacks. However, the returning Akhenjurs were very vulnerable because of the long baggage trains, which consisted of booty and slaves. The Akhenjur raiding parties increasingly suffered casualties against the territorial defense units. And occasionally, large-scale disasters literally wiped out whole groups of Akhenjurs. A related factor was the operational pause of the Ottomans between 1470s and the 1520s, during which the western frontier of the Ottoman Empire was stabilized, and for the first time, the government had to deal with the defense of the frontier provinces. This, this situation provided opportunities for some of the more ambitious and talented frontier provincial governors to fill these defence requirements. At first, they raised provincial defence units, but soon these units proved capable of cross-frontier raiding operations and developed in a sort of dual purpose. They performed better than hereditary Akhenjur families because they were more loyal to the central government. The famous first governor of Bosnia, Isabe, was, very good, was a very good example of this type of effective leader was able to create an effective military capability. At the same time, this new generation of governments founded a totally new frontier of light cavalry unit called the Delhi, Daredevil, or literally crazy, as their personal retinues. The Bosnian and Semendina governors created the first Delhis, but the leader most associated with these troops was the Bosnian governor Ghazi Husrebe, better known as Husrebegova. Who employed, more, um, who employed about 10,000 of them so effectively that the frontier and inland district governors of Rumelia began to Im imitate him. The Delhis were a totally different type of Ottoman soldier. Most of them were recent converts to Islam, usually from Bosnian, Serb and Croat origin, and were fanatically dedicated to wage war against infidels. They wore exaggerated and wild costumes as uniforms, which were a mixture of furs and feathers of animals of prey. The weapons also looked terrifying, with exaggerated features and accessories. However, all these served as a very important purpose, which was to terrify the enemy, with their wild and vicious outfits and their, most, and their almost supernatural courage and dare, daring. The Delis became contemporary phenomena, and sometimes their presence alone intimidated enemy units. In, in, in addition to their raiding potential, they turned out to be more useful than Akhenjur in conventional military duties due to their superior command control and organizational structure. Not surprisingly, as the importance of prestige of the Akhenjurs decreased, the government began to assign them combat service support roles.
such as road clearance and menial tasks associated with siege engineering during the campaigns at the end of the 16th century. It is possible that the Akanjus would have met the same fate of other auxiliary units had the disasters de defeat. It is possible, it is probable that the Akanjus would have met the same fate of other auxiliary units had the disastrous defeat of Yerogu not taken place. However, the new formation that had taken the place of Akanjus also demonstrated shortcomings in addition to their positive qualities. The Tatars had a tendency to see war as a means to acquire booty and often had little regard for friend or foe. Consequently, they had a notorious reputation of disciplinary problems, but since they did not have the potential to create a political or military problems like the Akanjus, the Ottomans tolerated their behavior. Similarly, the problematic characteristic of the Delhi units interfered with their employment. They were part of the personal retinue of a political governor, and at the end of the governor's assignment, they were dismissed. The Delis had then to seek another patron or find another job. This was usually not a problem for men because of their numbers were limited, and there was a constant need for experienced light cavalry. This shortcoming did not create a large problem during the classical period, in which the employment opportunities were generally high. However, it would become part of a wider, it would become part of a wider mercenary problem in the following centuries. Because of the strategic orientation of the empire, difficult terrain, and limited opportunities for booty, the Akanjus or similar types of formations were not raised initially at the eastern and southern frontiers. Instead, the government tried to fill this vacuum by making use of semi-independent tribal political entities like Kurds, Turkomans, Circassians, and Arabs. In this regard, the Kurdish tribes and federations especially played an important role against the Safavids. However, the government had to spend sizable amounts of money and had to negotiate them continuously to keep them loyal and under control. Increasing the presence of permanent fortress garrisons did help, but did not solve the problem. The structural problem of the ever fluid allegiances and loyalties of the greedy tribal chiefs. In addition to the Delhis, frontier provinces hired mercenary types of auxiliary groups, Arabs, Martelosses, Pharisees as mercenary cavalrymen, very similar to Delhis as well as local cannoneers and the like for manning fortresses. And so that ends our discussion on the provincial forces of the Ottoman Empire. Um, we learned, of, just, to, just to recap, we learned about the Akinja forces, we learned of uh, the Delhi forces who replaced them, the Tata Crimean Incarnate who assisted the Ottomans in Europe. Uh, we have very little information on the provincial forces of eastern uh, of the eastern Ottoman Empire, so we had to skip through that as fast as possible. Um, anyway, so thanks for listening, and I hope you uh, tune in for the next episode.